In the summer, entering into my freshman year of high school, I was asked to come to freshman-only basketball tryout. I was so excited that I got the invite from our head coach. But when I got there, I immediately fell out of place because I was super small. There was this one girl in particular who was just the best of the best, and her name was Hayden. She happened to be a freshman too, obviously, but she definitely didn't look like one or play like one. I knew only a few other girls at the tryouts, but I really wanted to get to know Hayden. Hayden was a popular girl even before school ever started because she was that good in basketball. All around our community, people knew who Hayden was. And to be honest, I wanted to be Hayden's friend so bad, but the only thing was, it seemed like she didn't want any new friends. Tryouts lasted for a couple of days, and the first day I tried making some small talk with Hayden. But it seemed like she kept giving me the cold shoulder. And then the second day, I just watched how she ran plays, how she dribbled the ball up and down the court because I wanted her to notice that I was paying attention to her game. But no matter what I tried, she didn't notice me. She always spoke to other girls trying out for the basketball team except me. So I'd find myself thinking things like, if only I were stronger and bigger, maybe Hayden would then notice me. If I were better in basketball, maybe then Hayden would notice me. If I were faster, quicker, maybe then Hayden would notice me. If only I were taller, maybe Hayden then would notice me. It's crazy, I know, you're probably thinking, Crystal, you did all of that to just get Hayden's attention? But be honest, we have probably all had if only I were thoughts like that about someone we wanted to be friends with. Of course, we all have. But this doesn't just happen when we want someone to notice us in sports. We have a tendency to bring this if only I were mindset into other relationships and areas of our lives as well. Maybe we think that if I can hit all of my lines perfectly in the production, my theater director would like me. If I can be the best player on the lacrosse field, my coach would like me. If I can get the best grades, my teacher will like me, and if I can keep from making dumb decisions at home, maybe just maybe my parents would like me. If I can keep up with everyone else in the school, maybe my friends would like me. You might think of it as trying to fill a cup, which would mean it's enough. So we're gonna go ahead and write enough on here because this is what all of us wanna feel. We want to feel good enough. For example, take grades. You may not think you are the smartest person in the world, but in your mind, there's a certain level of success in this area that will be enough for your teacher, your parent, step-parent, or guardian to approve of. Like this. Ooh, I got some on the table. Or take extracurricular things you are involved in. Maybe you're not the best player on the team or the best actor in your theater group. But in the position or role that you play, there's a certain expectation you have for yourself that you are not at. There's a gap between where you are and where you want to be. And that's just being enough. But your coach or your director put those expectations on you. That equals a good performance in that role. And if you can do what you are expected to do without messing it up, you'll be enough. That coach or that director will be happy with you. This happens in so many areas of our life. We believe that success and great performance inevitably leads to being liked and accepted. If we are funny enough, smart enough, skinny enough, trendy enough, fast enough, pretty enough, strong enough, winning enough, successful enough, and even Christian enough, then we'll be enough. Isn't that right? But there are some problems with this mindset. The first problem is this. We compare ourselves to other people. We know the area where we do pretty well, where we can get close to the enough line. But we also know the areas where we don't do as well. And we have the tendency to focus on the negative. We focus on the people who seem to be above the enough line in those areas, which naturally leads us to compare ourselves with people who seem smarter, cooler, wiser, nicer, more popular, or even more responsible than us. And since we feel like we could never compare to them, we decide that we will never be enough. In other words, there's always someone who is better along than us, which in turn make us feel like we have to get better in order to be enough. And when it comes to comparison, we will always find someone else who is seemingly 
better than us. And the second problem with this mindset is this. We compare ourselves to ourselves. We all have an invisible standard that we need to live up to. And as soon as we fail in that area, we decide we are not enough. Let's say you play a great game in basketball, and that's awesome, but then that game becomes your new standard, which means you expect yourself to play like that every single time. Let's think about it for a second. We can add more of these to the cup because that's what we're feeling. If I play the good game, then maybe, just maybe, I'll be enough. It's like we've raised the standard for what enough is. You reach the enough line only to find it still isn't enough. So you move the line higher and higher, hoping you feel enough next time. You continually find yourself in a no-win situation. Everyone in this room has felt not enough at some point, even the people who seem like they have it all together. For me, it was Hayden. She had it all together on the basketball court. It's a universal experience, and if we are honest, we'll all have a hard time liking the person who doesn't measure up, the person who isn't enough, and the person who is, in fact, us. Okay, okay, that's the bad news. But the good news is that what we are talking about today can be a game changer when it comes to the tension that every one of us feel. And we find this insight from the Apostle Paul. Paul was one of the wisest teachers of the early church. He shared a ton of practical ways to follow Jesus and experience a great life. One of Paul's most famous letters were written to people at the church in Rome. And in this letter, Paul goes to say this, don't copy the behaviors and customs of this world. Now, Paul's not saying don't copy your friend's style because your friend's style may be really cool or your favorite athlete's moves. Sometimes copying someone's skill is a way of learning from them, which isn't bad at all. No, but Paul is saying don't get stuck in the same thought patterns as everyone else. Don't mindlessly take on habits of everyone else. It's basically like the old school version of just because your friends jump off the bridge, would you do it? Paul is saying when everyone around you is doing something, you don't have to participate. Does everybody compare themselves to others? Sure, it's normal, but it doesn't mean you have to participate in comparing yourself. Does the media and advertisements try to convince you that you are not enough unless you buy their product? Definitely, but you can refuse to believe those messages are true. Do most people spend most of their time trying to get up to the line of enough in all of these areas? Absolutely, but you can refuse to participate in the enough game altogether. You see, Paul is saying that you and I have the freedom to pay attention to the messages being communicated to us and to be empowered in how we respond to them. Next, he goes on to say this, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. This one is huge because Paul is encouraging us to invite God into the way we think, to pay attention to what we are thinking and then ask God to be a part of it. We live in a culture where people feel like they are never enough. So inviting God into the way we see ourselves is a huge deal. Because when we invite God into this area, we'll realize that our tendency to feel less than doesn't line up with what God thinks about us at all. And we only know what God thinks when we invite him into the way we think. Paul tells us to literally ask God to change our thinking patterns. Paul continues, then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. God's will may sound a little weird and may be a weird phrase for some of you, but it just means what God wants for you. So when we invite God into the way we think, we are able to learn what God wants for us. And one big thing God wants for you is to see yourself the way he sees you. His view of you is perfect because he made you. And in fact, he loves you so much. He made you in his image. You are the only one like you. And there is no one that can be duplicated. He's proud of you. When he looks at you, you mean the world to him. You are his. God wants you to see you the way he sees you. And when you see yourself as he does, you won't feel the need to continually pursue a better, higher enough. Instead, you'll realize that you are enough today right now, 
right where you're sitting. Here's a simple way to think about it. I can like me because God loves me. Let me say that again because I don't want you to miss it. I can like me because God loves me. When we understand that we are made in God's image and that He assigns incredible worth to all of us, it should transform the way we see ourselves. Our worth isn't attached to us doing enough to be enough. Our worth is attached to being children of God. We didn't have to do anything. God has already done it all. With that in mind, Paul continues a few verses later. In His grace, God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. So if God has given you the ability to prophesy, speak out with as much faith as God has given you. There's another version that rephrases it like this. Let's just go ahead and be what we were made to be without enviously or pridefully comparing ourselves with each other or trying to be something we aren't. That first line sums it up. Let's just go ahead and be what we were made to be and who we were made to be. That is God's children. You didn't have to do anything to be God's child. If you can begin to see yourself the way he sees you, you can be transformed into something greater than a person who compares yourself to others. Think of it this way. God has an infinite amount of everything. Talent, information, intelligence, skills, basically any category where we feel like we aren't enough, God has plenty of it. And it's like He is saying to us, you don't have to worry about being enough here. You don't have to worry about this. I've got more than enough. Even it overflows. And what about grades? God says to us, I am enough. Maybe you're thinking, what about sports? God is saying to us, I am enough. And what about family? God is saying to us, I am enough. Should you work hard? Absolutely. But whether you play great or have a bad game, your worth doesn't change. You are not a bad game or a good one. You are not a bad outfit or a good one. You are not a bad fight or a lifetime of good behavior. God is saying, you are my child and your enoughness isn't dependent on how you play or how you perform or even how you look. Your enoughness comes from me. Now, this sounds nice, right? But I know that it's not easy to believe and it's even harder to remember. Here are two ways to begin changing the way you think. The first is to invite God into your thinking. Does your current thinking line up with the way God feels about you? Here's one simple way to find out. Ask someone, maybe a leader at church or a trusted adult. If you are feeling a certain way, simply say, hey, I feel this way. Am I seeing this the way God sees it? They'll be honest with you. But more importantly, there's a good chance you'll know the answer before you even finish asking the question. Just hearing yourself say it out loud can sometimes jar our minds to realizing we are being irrational. And the second is to repent. I know repent is a very churchy word, but the meaning is simple and practical. Repent means to go in a different direction. It's like changing the channel or picking a different show to watch. In this case, repent means find a new way of things. Find new thoughts and messages to replace the old ones. In this case, repent means finding new thoughts and messages to replace the old ones. Take those old messages that aren't true about you and find new messages about yourself that line up with what God has to say about you. Don't stay stuck in the old way of thinking. Start something new based on what God thinks about you. Some of you may need more than just you to change the channel. It may require the help of a friend, your leader at church, a parent, a coach, or maybe a professional counselor or therapist. I know it seems like a lot of work to change the way we think, but it's worth it, I promise you, because all we're thinking literally affects every part of our life. Doing the work to change will take time, but the benefits will prove it was worth the work. Listen, it's possible to like you because God loves you, but here's a secret. You probably won't get there alone. 
You need other people to help you see yourself clearly. That's why it's important to have those people in your life, to talk to those people in your life, and to listen to those people in your life. But imagine if this actually happened. If you could look in the mirror every single day and like yourself, you weren't suddenly smarter or better looking. It was the same you. You just thought differently. You just saw yourself the way that God sees you. Love.